Good, good, after, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. I'm Michael Kugelman. I'm the Senior Associate for South Asia with the Wilson Center's Asia Program. Uh, thank you for braving the bad weather, for braving the dysfunctional and delayed public subway system uh, to get here. Really appreciate it. I uh, also wanted to extend a special thanks to our institutional co-sponsors for today's uh, event, the Wilson Center's Middle East Program and the Wilson Center's Maternal Health uh, Initiative. Just a few brief words about the Wilson Center for those of you who may be here for the first time. We are chartered by Congress as the official memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, we serve as the nation's key nonpartisan policy forum for tackling global issues through independent research uh, and open dialogue to inform actionable ideas for the policy community. Uh, at the Wilson Center, preeminent scholars and experts research topics of national and international relevance. And in the spirit of President Wilson, who was the only U.S. president to have held a PhD, we build a bridge between the uh, worlds of academia and public policy to inform and develop solutions to the nation's problems and challenges. So our discussion this morning uh, will revolve around Afghanistan, a country that, as you all know, faces a fair number uh, of challenges, and challenges that go well beyond those of security, which tend to get most of the attention uh, here in Washington. And one such challenge is public health. Um, most of us sitting here today and tuning in via our uh, live webcast uh, will have a general sense of the health sector uh, in Afghanistan and what's going on. But there's, there's also much that we don't know. Um, but fortunately, there is some more data available now. Just recently, Afghanistan completed its first ever demographic and health survey, an assessment tool which is used by dozens of countries around the world to evaluate a population's health. Um, I imagine most of you saw outside there are copies of the key indicators report and an additional summary document, which you should certainly take a copy of on your way out if you haven't already. Um, this morning we'll be uh, discussing key indicators from this survey, uh, and we are delighted and honored to have with us this morning His Excellency Farazuddin Faroz, Afghanistan's Minister for Public Health. Um, Dr. Faroz has been in his current position since February 2015. He originally joined the Afghan Public Health Ministry in 2002. He played a significant role in developing several key Afghan health programs credited for improving health services coverage and reducing morbidity and mortality rates. Uh, joining Dr. Faroz uh, this morning on this panel are two other distinguished voices uh, on this topic. One is Dr. Syed Alam Shinwari, President of the Afghan Medical Professionals Association of America and also an international health systems advisor at the Center for Global Health Engagement. And uh, our other speaker is uh, Larry Sampler, who is uh, assistant to the administrator in USAID's Office of Afghanistan and Pakistan Affairs, or as most people in circles around here tend to call it, uh, OAPA. Um, so the format and then there's a, a handout with biographical information. Uh, the format will be as follows. Um, Dr. Feroz has kindly offered to entertain a few questions that I'll pose to him, um, which he'll respond to. Uh, and then we will uh, hear some comments from our other two speakers before we uh, open things up to a, a discussion and a Q&A uh, with all of us. Final note before we begin. We encourage you that would like to to live tweet this event using the hashtag Afghanistan Health. Um, please do not refrain. Um, so, with that said, let's let's start the discussion. Uh, I'll pose a few questions to Dr. Faroz. Um, and the first one, I'll I'll go right into it because I know that this is a big concern um, here in Washington, um, and I know this is something that your ministry is really focused on here, and that is the, the challenge of corruption. Um, so if you could speak on the efforts that your ministry has been taking um, to address corruption in the health sector. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, good morning, everybody. You know, availing this opportunity, I would like to express my deep appreciation to you, to your people, and to the U.S. government for your generous support being provided to the people of Afghanistan, particularly to the health sector. In response to your question, you know, corruption is not only a major concern for international community, but also to the general public in Afghanistan. Since my appointment uh, last year, 
as a Minister of Public Health, I have been trying to ensure greater efficiency and accountability in our day-to-day -day work. I am committed to strengthen uh, good governance within the Ministry of Health as part of our efforts to reduce uh, corruption in the health system of Afghanistan. This is why I invited, I requested an independent body which is called MEC. MEC stands for Independent Anti-Corruption Monitoring and Evaluation Committee to come to the Ministry to undertake a risk assessment of corruptions in the health sector. They took it and uh, fortunately uh, also I would like to thank to USAID for funding this project. The result of this report was released last month and my ministry is the first ministry in the, United, in the unity government of Afghanistan which has undertaken this initiative, which, uh, which uh, it has their own risks. Uh, now we are in the process of developing anti-corruption strategy and work plan. I will assure that the Ministry of Health will make a strong effort to put its house in order. But I would like to mention that this job cannot be done alone or in isolation. To a great, greater extent, the sustain, sustainability and the impact of our anti-corruption work is dependent on the pl uh, wider political context. I am sure, or oh, to, wrap, to wrap up to this question, you know, there is a strong political will in the unity government of Afghanistan. The president of Afghanistan, the chief executive of Afghanistan, they are committed to fight against corruption. Me as a minister of health, also I am committed to fight corruptions in Afghanistan, in the health sector. And also with the implementation of the recommendations that we received from this report, hopefully we will be able to uh, start fighting against corruptions and to be able to reduce it corruption to greater extent. Thank you. Um, another considerable challenge in the health sector in Afghanistan, as you know, is shortages of, of medical specialists. I think you, you yourself had said uh, earlier this year that there are only two doctors for every 10,000 people uh, in Afghanistan. The UN has said that um, about 80 percent of the country's need for maternal health professionals is unmet. Um, and Particularly importantly, th there's also a very low number of female medical doctors, um, including those focused on maternal health. So I don't know if you wanted to discuss um, what Afghanistan has done or can do to address the shortages of medical uh, specialists. Uh, well, in response to your question, uh, there are, you know, two main strategies that the ministry have been taken or have been pursued. First one is long-term strategy, which requires or which, which will take at least 10 years. As you know, edu education in medical college requires six years. Then you know another five years to done your specialty. You know it will take 10 years. And you know the mothers cannot be waited till you know uh, the, a medical doctor is graduated from the medical uh, uh, university. So we have taken, you know, the short-term approach or short-term strategy, which is the training of midwives and community midwives. This training, you know, requires uh, two, uh, two years. Uh, fortunately, in Afghanistan, we have at least one midwifery training center in each province. In 2002, the number of midwives was around 500 across the country. And now this number has been increased to 5,000 across the country. It means that our health facilities, you know, at least 60% of our health facilities have at least one skilled midwife. Not only about the quantity, we are also focused on the quality side of the training. Uh, we accredited the curriculum of midwifery training by the uh, accredited international bodies. Uh, as well as international experiences shows that, you know, training of midwives is very cost effective and very efficient towards reduction, maternal mortality, as well as improving the health. As there is, you know, correlation between the number 
uh, as the number is increasing, also we can observe uh, improvement in maternal mortality as well as in child mortality. As you know, the last uh, nationally representative demographic and health survey made possible by USID shows that there is substantial improvement in maternal health in Afghanistan, as well as under five mortality has been de decreased dramatically, which is estimated to be around 55 uh, deaths per thousand live births, compared to 100, uh, in 100 deaths per 1,000 live births in 2010. This shows that if we train more midwives, skilled midwives, and if we post them throughout uh, across the uh, country, especially in the remote areas, you know, I am sure that the health of mothers will be improved, mortality will be reduced, and uh, morbidity will be reduced. Now let's turn to polio. Uh, Afghanistan, of course, being one of only a few countries in the world where uh, polio is still endemic. Uh, and if you don't invite you to speak about the challenges that that polio continues to present uh, and progress um, that you'd like to um, uh, discuss that Afghanistan has made in dealing with, in combating uh, polio? Unfortunately, Afghanistan is one of the country, one of the two countries that is still, you know, suffering from polio. The government of Afghanistan remains passionately committed to eradicate polio in Afghanistan. So far, there have been six cases reported. The range of activities and strategies that we are pursuing uh, are helping us to contain this number. The problem with polio is the main challenge is insecurity and instability, especially in remote areas and in insecure areas. You know, the reasons, there are, you know, a couple of reasons. I would like to mention that. That why, you know, insurgents are not letting us to administer polio or to, you know, uh, reach the unreached population. There are, you know, a couple of reasons. One reason is that a high political endorsement of polio program in Afghanistan. Second, you know, insurgents see or feel that this is a direct arm of the government of Afghanistan. Third one is, unfortunately, there is a false belief that polio is a non-Islamic thing. In addition to that, our efforts towards eradication of polio is solely dependent on the efforts of our neighbor countries, Pakistan. Because there is population movements between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Although cross-border coordination initiatives have co Im continued to improve, we have, you know, regular meeting with our neighbors, with the Ministry of Health of Pakistan. We synchronized campaigns with them. But the main issue is to, you know, insecurity as well as unacceptability of polio in areas that are there is insurgency or there are insecure areas. We have done, you know, a couple of uh, strategies have been done. For example, we engage religious re leaders to talk to the community, to talk in the mosques about the acceptability of uh, polio vaccines in Afghanistan, which is working very well. Second, also, we are trying to maintain the neutrality of the program. The third one is we are working on the convergence of polio program with community-based health care. For example, the distribution of network is linked to the polio vaccinations. And I'm sure with these efforts, we will be able not only to contain the number, but also to be able to uh, eradicate it. Hmm. Thank you. Um, two more questions, really, are concluding questions before we uh, hear from our other uh, panelists. First one is, um, what are the efforts that your ministry has made toward achieving uh, financial self-sufficiency? Self um, can you, are you in a position to offer a time frame uh, for when the ministry will no longer require uh, significant levels of international donor support? I see this is really a very tough question, <laughs> and I'm not sure <laughs> I'll be able to... Uh? I'm taking it. Yeah. Okay, to answer it. 
But you know, as currently our health sector is, you know, dependent on external financial assistance, as well as out of pocket payment. Out of pocket payments means, you know, patients are paying out of their pockets. No doubt that there is, you know, something of a link between the significant amount that the donor communities put into the health sector since 2002 and the achievements have been made to in the health sector up to date. In addition to that, you know, we cannot guarantee and we are not sure that, you know, financial assistance will be continued any longer. Therefore, the Ministry of Health is working on our own resources to generate, you know, resources from domestic revenues. For example, introduction of tax on tobacco. Rough estimations, you know, uh, done a couple of months back, it showed that if we introduce tax on tobacco, you know, about 30 million USD will be generated per year. In addition to that, we are trying to introduce uh, insurance schemes, for example, social insurance scheme as well as community insurance scheme. These schemes are very new in Afghanistan. We are going to pilot it in a small scale. However, our dependency will be continued for a while. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, final question is if you could uh, simply identify what you view as the single biggest achievement in the health sector over the last year and also what you feel the single biggest challenges that remains in the sector. Uh, you know, as I said, that uh, Afghanistan demographic and health survey shows that there is substantial improvement in maternal health. Maternal mortality have been reduced. Under five, mortality has been decreased significantly. Nutritional status of women has improved. Vaccination coverage has increased. These, you know, progress have been made through high-level commitment, productive working environment with development partners, as well as uh, national and international NGOs, scaling up of cost-effective and life-saving interventions across the country, training midwives, as well as attention to equity and those who are living in remote areas. Despite these, you know, progress, these progresses or these achievements, Afghanistan still faces many challenges. For example, instability and insecurity, which hampers, you know, uh, accessibility and reaching uh, unreached areas. Second one is, you know, poverty, unemployment, few number of uh, midwives or health staff across the country, dependency on external assistance. These are all the challenges that we are facing. So what to do? In spite of, you know, having these challenges in front of us, we are in the process of developing a national strategy for, for the next uh, five years. We will use this uh, recent survey as a baseline to measure the progress. This strategy focuses on increasing access to very remote areas, improving the quality of services, introducing the newly introduced cost-effective interventions, for example, the use of chlorhexidine the use of zinc, the use of mesoprostol to uh, prevent postpartum bleedings, as well as, you know, focusing on uh, equity issues. But the main point is that we are exploring ways or innovative ways to, you know, generate revenues as well as the gain that have sustained to be sustained continuously. Well, thank you. Uh, I imagine that uh, his, Dr. Feroz's comments have prompted some additional questions, but before we get to those, I just wanted to offer our other panelists an opportunity to say a few words. So, Dr. Shinwari, go ahead. Should I go down or whatever you prefer? Yes, please. Oh. Anybody who are comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
I like podiums. <laughs> Good morning. So, you know my name, Sayed Shinwari. I'm the president of Afghan Medical Professionals Association of America, long name. Uh, so, before I start, I would like to welcome uh, His Excellency uh, Dr. Firuzdin Feroz, the Minister of Afghan P P Minister of Public Health on behalf of AMPA, uh, and thank USAID for the continued uh, continuous support of Afghanistan's health sector, and thank you, Michael and his team with Wilson Center for um, organizing such a great event. So, I'm not going to go to too much technical details or, you know, focus on a specific topic, but rather I would just say some or share some examples or uh, the things that I have experienced when I was in Afghanistan. I was born there and I lived almost all my life. We did not, my family did not, uh, I mean, migrated ever. So I moved uh, from, from, from there at late 2007 to the United States, which means I have seen a lot of things. So, and, and there's, there's a lot to say. Uh, about Afghanistan, lots of positives, lots of negatives, and then it's up to us to be optimistic or pessimistic about the future of health sector in Afghanistan, or be ho hopeful or uh, uh, or hopeless. But personally, I have been, I have always been hopeful and optimistic about the the future of health sector in Afghanistan, and the reason is because I know how it looked like ten years ago. I know how it looked like five years ago, and I know, I know how it looked like 15 years ago when there was a Taliban regime, you know, controlling the country. So, some examples from the, from the darkest, or I can say the most ugliest um, chapter of the Afghan history, the Taliban regime time. Unfortunately, like half of my medical school was at that time. Uh, and that was the time that our dean for medical university was a priest, no medical, and no health background. Our Minister of Public Health was a priest, no medical, no health background. And the same for Minister of Education and the same for other key players in, in, in the health sector in Afghanistan. So imagine, you know, what, how would they, they serve the health sector, you know, when they, they do not have anything in terms of health or medicine in their background. So having said that, like, it was 15 years ago, but now we have a professional, medical professional, who is leading the health sector, who knows uh, what, what are the priorities or what are the needs of the country or the population. And the team that he has in the Ministry of Public Health, most of them are my classmates. They are not only doctors. They have, you know, masters in public health and, um, hosp uh, you know, hospital management. They have PhDs, which means it's, it's completely a professional leadership now. No priest anymore. So that was one example. And uh, you know, a lot of other issues, for example, uh, not having textbooks, uh, not having lab, uh, and, and also the destroyed you know, physical building, and, and those who, ha who, uh, who have been at that time. Uh, so you know, the buildings around the, the medical university were, were, was all destroyed. You know, when we were staying there overnight in the, in the dormitory, everybody was uh, scared. So a lot of other issues. But the most important and sad point about that time was that, you know, our sisters, women, girls were deprived of education, especially from higher education. To add a joke into it, uh, I had a friend uh, who was my classmate. Uh, he was saying that, you know, before he attends the medical school, he was dreaming that he will come to the medical school uh, and start, you know, finding a friend, female friend, start dating, and then, you know, we also watch Hollywood and Bollywood movies, and you see all these college, university, you know, dating and stuff. So that was his dream, one of the dreams besides education, that he will date someone and have her as a, as a wife for future, life partner. So he, was, uh, he had the dream to, be, to have a doctor wife. But he was saying, unfortunately, it was opposite. When I came to the university, so I ended up with 100 uh, classmates with long beard and uh, turbans in the class. And that's what, uh, you know, happened to them. Uh, so, in terms of gender issue, you know, we, a lot, we had a lot of issues that time. And as soon as, you know, the international community got involved and the regime collapsed, still we had a lot of issues. Why? Because we started from scratch, from zero. And it requires a lot of work, you know, to, to bring some positive changes. I, even in 2004, when, uh, when I had my, we had my uh, first child, uh, 
in the hospital called uh, Indra Gandhi Hospital for children, and I don't think it's, it's even one mile away from, from the palace. So he needed uh, oxygen therapy. I, you know, we took him to the hospital, uh, and there was a small room with five children, sick children, uh, but one uh, can of oxygen with one tube and one mask, and we were rotating this mask, you know, for all these five children. You know, as soon as one child turned blue, so we just moved, you know, the mask to that child, and then for the another child. So, with, with, which means that although we were working there, you know, all the stakeholders and all the key players and the funding and all the supports were there, but, you know, we were in the beginning of rebuilding and reconstructing the health sector, uh, and we needed a lot of work. So that, that was one uh, issue, uh, you know, even after the Taliban. Uh, and, and also, I remember, and, and I'm, I'm sure most of you remember who have been involved in the Afghan health sector, whether that's in terms of research or, uh, you know, practical work. If you remember, we kept hearing until 2010 that one in 16 mother is dying due to pregnancy-related complications or issue in, issues in Afghanistan. When was it? It was 15 years ago, right? Or one in five children are dying before the age of five. <coughs> But, you know, the survey in 2010, you saw that. In the survey, the recent sur uh, the, the, the survey that has been done, you, show, uh, you see a significant uh, change in it. Look at the, the life expectancy. You know, it was 44 or, and 46 for men and women, respectively, and now it's about 60. Look at the child mortality, maternal mortality, you know, have, uh, have declined. And in, in you see, a, you know, a significant change in maternal and child health. In the great program that I loved it, the midwifery program, that brought a, you know, uh, a significant change. As m most of you may know, around 80% of the people in Afghanistan are living in remote parts of the country. And you know, the m m most of them are cultural, you know, conservative people, and they require some people from their own to serve them. So the med midwives were a great intervention, you know, training midwives and sending them to provide those health services. And this was something that really improved the, the, the maternal and child health in Afghanistan. Not only the uh, you know, maternal and ch child health, but in general, the primary health, encouraging people for bad vaccination because there were some uh, negative uh, um, perspectives towards vaccines, as you know, uh, Dr. Feroz mentioned. Uh, but the midwives were the ones who, who, who helped us you know, to deliver that positive message to the people and let them know that, yeah, no, there isn't anything wrong with it. So that was a great achievement and, and great uh, work that the, minister, the, the health sector done, uh, you know, did there. Until 2007 or six, um, eight, I can say, I was part of the, the project that, you know, uh, that's sending kids with uh, congenital heart defects, with burn scans for plastic surgery, some basic surgeries for heart, like VSD like, uh, or ASD, sending them to, 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 uh, to the United States, to Canada, or to, you know, uh, to India, and especially to the West, it cost hundreds of thousands of dollars per child. And when they were coming here, another issue was, you know, most of them were trying not to get, go back. That was another issue. But now we have our own cardiac surgeons. They are performing surgeries, cardiac surgeries. Now we have our own uh, neurosurgeons. The other day, one of our doctors removed a very, I can say, horrible tumor from, from the brain, from one of our patients. And it's not the first case. They have been doing some great work there. So a lot of changes, whether that's in terms of, you know, secondary and tertiary uh, health or the primary health, we do have a lot of achievements. But it's just the beginning, like I said, 10, 15 years or, or nothing, you know. It, it's just rebuilding a health sector of a nation, you know, where, you know, the infrastructure and every, every, everything was destroyed 15 years ago. And it requires a lot of work. Some of the challenges were mentioned by uh, His Excellency Dr. Feroz, uh, and I will mention a few too. Yes, corruption, so, uh, and I'm glad, and we, uh, I can see the entire world, especially the Afghan population, welcomed the report that was led by uh, Dr. Feroz, you know, about the corruption and the causes, uh, causes of the corruption in the ministry, and this is something unique that, that is done by the health sector. Not other ministries have done it yet, and, you know, we encourage them to do, that, uh, to do the same. So that's a great achievement, achievement in terms of fighting the corruption. And the most important thing nowadays is that, you know, let me, let me tell you or share something that I hear from people. Because sometimes when I go live on Voice of America radio, you know, when I talk to my people and people, you know, ask me questions, so that their concern is the quality of health services. 
And one of the reasons that the Afghans are traveling outside Afghanistan, going to Pakistan, India, or other parts of the world, it's just the quality. When you ask them, why are you going there? Why are you not you know, seeking health care here? Oh, well, quality is better than... The other day when there was a tension between, you know, over the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, there was a Pakistani news um, in Peshawar saying that, you know, due to this tension in the blockade of the Turkham or, or the border, the hospitals in Peshawar entirely, they were empty. Indicating that, you know, it, 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 it had patients because Afghans were coming in as patients there. And there were different, you know, like estimations and, you know, numbers that like at least 5,000 patients are going to, you know, Pakistan. And estimations like at least, you know, $200 per person. Anyhow, different estimations. However, the problem, yeah, of course, quality of health services, it's not an issue that only Afghanistan is suffering from. Many countries in the world are suffering from. But it needs some work to be done about it. And how can we improve the, the quality of health services? And this is... This is where we, we need to support the health sector. I mean, as you heard from uh, His Excellency Dr. Feroz, that it's, you know, uh, it's not only something that the Ministry of Public Health will be able to do and tackle all these issues. You know, the stakeho other stakeholders, key players, or we should all get together and work with the Ministry of Public Health in order to eliminate or tackle the corruption uh, and also to improve the, 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 the quality of the health services in, in the country. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, to improve the quality of uh, health services, you know, it, it does have a lot of factors to be considered. So the, the uh, other ministries, uh, international agencies like USAID or, you know, or WHO, NGOs, non-for-profits like AMPA, if we all get together and shoulder by shoulder work together to improve the quality of health care there, uh, and, and, and also support the efforts that are made by the Ministry of Public Health. And I'm sure in the next 10 and 15 years, we will be competing with our region. Right now, we are, we are lagging behind in some of the indicators in the region. And, and if, if such work, you know, is continued, and I can promise you that in the next 10, 15 years, uh, you know, we will have a great or positive picture or image from, from Afghanistan. So just... My final, uh, some final lines about AMPA, and I kept talking about AMPA, it's just a, an example of the support that we have for uh, Minister of Public Health or Health Sector. AMPA it stands for Afghan Medical Professionals Association of America. Uh, it has been serving since 1992 uh, our Afghan community, whether they are here in the United States, around the world, or especially in Afghanistan, you know, through different projects and programs. Uh, and Thanks. Uh, I would like to thank the, uh, His Excellency Dr. Feroz for uh, uh, giving us the opportunity to, to sign an, an agreement of collaboration with the Ministry of Public Health, uh, and that helped us a lot to intervene in different uh, areas in Afghanistan. So just a few lines about what we are doing. Basically, we are serving our community here in the United States through providing some health fair, free screening, health education, and, you know, uh, uh, like uh, organizing some events, symposiums, or, you know, scientific sessions, bringing in all these experts, medical professionals, uh, to share their expertise and knowledge, uh, and, and, uh, but focus is always Afghanistan. For example, if we bring in scientifics, we just focus on infectious diseases and how we can improve, and, you know, uh, the health of people in Afghanistan in terms of infectious diseases. And internationally, we do have some other programs, too. Recently, we had a great project led by one of our great colleagues, Dr. Zohal. She's sitting in the back. She's our hero. So she was able to lead a group of medical professionals to Greece to help our Afghan refugees who were in need of health services. So they did provide a wonderful uh, service for them. And it's a continuous or ongoing process. And next, and next teams are going to be uh, deployed there and provide those services. And in terms of uh, Afghanistan, we do have a lot of um, programs. One of them is telemedicine. Right now, our, our professionals are providing mental health consultations for our patients directly to some, uh, uh, through uh, you know, Skype to uh, some patients in clinics there. Uh, and we have been working uh, with uh, American Association of Medical Colleges. Um, they have a program called Global Health uh, Opportunities, um, uh, GLO, Global Health Learning Opportunities, that, have, that has more than 70 countries as members, and they are working together, together to exchange their medical students. And we're targeting, we have targeted six universities to connect those universities with a GLO program to ex start exchange medical students. 
that's uh, another thing. And, and also the <coughs> uh, media. We have been using media. Our uh, members, our, our colleagues are providing health education for the purpose of health promotion, you know, especially Voice of America has been helping us a lot. You know, our local media providing health education to our people uh, through TV, news, and also Facebook pages, Skypes, uh, and a lot of other activities. If, if you want to learn more about it, you can ask me questions. I already, I think, took more than 10 minutes. So uh, we can continue in our panel discussion. However, the final word will, will be uh, that we, we have done, uh, I can say that at 30% of the work and 70% of the work is left for Afghanistan in order to have us stabilized in, in, in a great uh, health sector. So it requires contribution for, from everyone, whether they're Afghans or non-Afghans, whether they're, they're um, na Afghan national uh, organizations or international organizations, as we did support the country in the past 15 years and let's support the country in the <coughs> next 15 or 20 more years in order to have it self-efficient uh, and, and, and also great health sector. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Shinwari. You've managed to uh, highlight a, a theme, that of hope, or relative hope, that one tends to not hear about, uh, hear, hear much of uh, in this uh, city these days. So I appreciate that. So now go to uh, Larry Sampler. Thank you. I will use the podium not because I like them, but because I've just come back from meetings in Brussels, and I'm so jet-lagged I'll sleep if I sit at the table. Um, that being third on a panel is always a challenge because the good things have all been said and you're left sort of with the drags. I'll, I'll note that Michael alluded to the, uh, the fantastic DHS report and I do encourage you to pick up a copy when you leave. Um, the minister talked very eloquently about the things that the ministry has done and will uh, and expects to continue to do. And then Dr. Shinwari has talked a lot and very personally about some of the experiences of health care in Afghanistan. What I want to do is a little bit different. Um, I am the Assistant Administrator at USAID for Afghanistan and Pakistan Affairs, and I will have accomplished my goal when I leave the podium if I've not just told you that we are committed to supporting health care in Afghanistan, but explain to you why we're committed. And, and I think when people understand why you're committed to a particular cause, it makes it easier to believe that you are indeed uh, intending to stay committed. I'm going to hit two historical points that kind of will launch us in the direction of the, of the point that I want to make. And the, the point I want to make is that the United States government and USAID are committed to health care in Afghanistan for the long haul. So first, let me thank Michael and CSIS for hosting an event like this. I think these are tremendous opportunities for professionals such as yourselves and interested members of the community to have conversations. And it's a great chance for the minister to talk about this study, which is truly a remarkable achievement in the milestones of, of Afghanistan. But I'm going to go back to 1947, when at the time Secretary of State, excuse me, George Marshall, was giving a supposedly fairly unimportant speech at commencement at Harvard University. It turned out to be one of the most important speeches of the post-war decade. That was the speech where uh, Secretary Marshall laid out what's called the Marshall Plan for Europe. Um, in the Marshall Plan, one of the, and I've written it down so I get it right, one of the most poignant quotes that, that summarizes or encapsulates what he intended was he said, it is logical that the United States should do whatever it is able to do to assist in the return of normal economic health in the world, without which there can be no political stability and no assured peace. He went on in his speech to talk about the importance of economic activity with respect to public health with respect to malnutrition and starvation and maladies that were the cities of Europe were suffering from a series of health crises one after the other. And the Marshall speech and the Marshall plan addressed the linkage between economic governance and economic health and public health. And that's one of the thematic underpinnings of why USAID will continue to support public health in Afghanistan. You cannot have a vibrant economy without a healthy population, and you cannot sustain a healthy population without a growing economy. Second historical milestone. In 2007, Senator Barack Obama, campaigning for president, said in one of his speeches, I will make it a focus of my foreign policy to roll back the tide of hopelessness that gives rise to hate. Freedom must also mean freedom from want, not just freedom lost to an empty stomach. 
And you could add to that freedom loss to an unhealthy family because we know from demographic studies in other places and from the work we do around the world, if a family suffers an unanticipated health crisis, it drives that family further into economic deprivation and further below the poverty line. So our strategy in Afghanistan today is born along the lines of this same philosophy. Restoring the basics that make life possible for individuals and families, we can help build the confidence that drives economic growth and national stability. USAID's efforts to reconstruct Afghanistan's health sector in partnership with the Afghan government and with other donors have to be viewed through this holistic lens. While not sufficient on its own, access to quality health care is a necessary prerequisite for confidence in one's own future, importantly the future of one's family and community, and the future of one's country. So this is why USAID in 2002 made some very specific decisions. In 2002, we invested $5 million in what we call Quick Impact Immediate Health Needs Programming. It was purely humanitarian. There was no capacity building. We did not consult with Afghan partners. There was no Ministry of Public Health to consult with. If there had been, it would have been a, a priest, as you said, or a, or a MOA. We, we put money into delivering health services ourselves. Today, things have changed in ways that are just immeasurable. And for those of you who travel to Afghanistan, I hope you notice the changes as I do. When I was there in 2002, they had no ministries. They had no capacity. Today, we're very proud to share a stage with Minister Faroz, with Dr. <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Shinwari, who demonstrate the growth and the successes that Afghanistan has had. The um, demographic and health survey, also supported by USAID, kind of demonstrates how far the Afghan public health sector has come and also how far it has to go. I won't go into the details they've already discussed and you'll see for yourself when you read through the material. The areas of, of great success and areas of, of uh, still some significant need. But I do want to give some credit to the people who did this survey. Trained surveyors, and, and, and I'm not one, but people who were trained in doing demographic population surveys had to travel to some incredibly remote parts of the country and some incredibly unstable and insecure parts of the country to do this survey. Unpaved roads, mountainous terrain, community sensitivities that were mentioned, very tenuous security. I mean, Afghanistan, if you haven't been there, is a beautiful, beautiful country, but it's a series of 10,000 beautiful communities scattered across a very isolated and, in some cases, very remote um, topography. In Kunduz, for example, the survey team had to actually travel into Tajikistan and access the municipalities from across the international border because the security on the road to Kunduz was not adequate um, to travel there directly. So as a result of their courage, we have the first nationally representative survey of the state of health care in Afghanistan that's ever been conducted. It applies what we call the gold standard methodology that's used in 90 other countries across the globe and will now allow for comparisons with those countries. Through our partnership with the Ministry of Public Health, USAID has helped to rebuild the health system brick by brick and health worker by health worker, as you heard. We've supported over 600 health facilities across the country to ensure that Afghans and even the most remote communities could obtain what we take for granted, things like ibuprofen or antibiotics that truly are what they say on the package and are not, in fact, dangerous counterfeits. As was discussed, we train thousands of midwives and community health workers, and I can't stress enough how important these community health workers are. As Dr. Shinwari and the minister alluded to, particularly for women, health care providers must be from the local community. It's just not acceptable that they not be. So the health care workers and the midwives have been an enormous success in Afghanistan. Most importantly, one of the things I'll point out is that the Ministry of Public Health and the Afghan Central Statistics Organization took the lead in conducting this survey themselves. Again, that in itself is an enormous milestone. I was in Afghanistan living and working for the United Nations there when the CSO, the Central Statistics Office, basically started its work. And they began with nothing. But the progress being made in public health and in the, <coughs> excuse me, and in the DHS could not have been done without progress made in areas of education. And the progress being made in areas of education could not have been done without progress made in the areas of health. So again, back to the Marshall theme and back to President Obama's theme, there's a synergistic 
I call it cycle of goodness, that we have to have public health if we wish to have these other societal gains and to make them permanent. I also want to take a moment to applaud the minister for his uh, efforts to tackle corruption in the ministry. He brought it up and mentioned it himself in his remarks. The work that was done by MEC at his particular request is, uh, is groundbreaking for Afghanistan. And we sincerely hope that his example will be used by other ministries um, to that the other ministers will also invite the MEC to come in and examine their systems for vulnerabilities to corruption. Because the this self-examination is, I think, a necessary first step to building better and stronger institutions in Afghanistan. Um, in the years I've been working in Afghanistan, I'm going to share one anecdote with you. It's a story of one, midnight, mid, one midwife. Her name is Fariba. She lived in a very remote community, and it was very common for women walking to get medical care or walking to give birth to a child to literally die on the road in her community because they couldn't get where they needed to be before they went into labor or before they had a medical emergency. And Fariba had always wanted to be able to do something to help those women. The access to the midwife training program gave her that opportunity. And her community is one now where the women are well served by a local woman and I will note that Fariba now is a train-the-trainer midwife, so she's training other young women to be midwives as well. But it, it is an example of how the local community approach to public health is working in Afghanistan. So moving forward, um, again, I told you I'll have done my job if I walk away from this podium or from the panel discussion and you're convinced that USAID is in this for the long haul and that our support to public health remains strong, and it does. We'll continue to focus on making health care accessible across the country, including women and children. We will increase our efforts and continue to help the ministry to grow so that the Ministry of Public Health can continue to do the things the minister has talked about here. And again, contrast that with 2002. In 2002, we had to do it ourselves, and it gives me great pride as a development professional to now hear the minister sit here and talk about the things that they're doing to build their own self-sufficiency. We will continue to focus on um, newborns, nutritional, excuse me, nutritional supplements, public awareness campaigns, and supporting NGOs to tackle particular problems at particular community levels. And perhaps most importantly, we will continue to partner with the ministry. I'm going to skip to the end of my remarks and just say, you know, George Marshall, before he was, uh, he was a general officer, he fought in World War II, but if you ask around what was George Marshall famous for? It was for recognizing the, the cycle of goodness that I described. You can't have stability without having economic activity. You can't have economic activity without having health. And you can't have good public health without security and economic growth. I think um, this is the way I'll sum up. Michael asked the question to the minister about how they will become self-sufficient. The minister quite candidly and quite honestly said he's doing everything he can to make his ministry self-sufficient, but that the international donor community will be needed for years to come. It's not my ability. I, I can't speak for the U.S. Congress or for the next United States president, but what I can say is that it is my expectation that USAID will remain committed to supporting public health in Afghanistan for the years to come. Thank you. Well, thank you, Larry, and, and thanks to all three of our uh, panelists. Uh, I imagine that there are some questions uh, that you all would like to pose to the panel, so uh, we'll now move into that part of the program. Um, please wait until you're called on, until you ha have a microphone in front of you uh, before you pose your question, and please keep your question to a question, not more, so that we can ensure that as many people as possible pose one. Um, so if we have a, a, a show of hands, we'll, we'll get started. So we'll start with the gentleman uh, right there. Um, the, the blue and white striped shirt. Hi, I'm, uh, Hi. My name is oh, hold on, sorry. If you could just put the gentleman with the mic okay. is going to go first. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, I'm Phil Schrafer. Uh, I'm retired. I was the health advisor to the U.S. Embassy in uh, Turkmenistan. I used to say, uh, go to Afghanistan, take a left. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, 
So the problem is huge. So the foreign aid to the health programs and so on is not going to solve solve the problem. We have to think outside of the box. And what I'm saying is it has to be a negotiated truce uh, and bring in new actors like Pakistan, China, Russia. And the, the Taliban, by the way, the worst Well, I think that we, we get the, the point that you're trying to make, um, and it may go a bit out, outside of the realms of what we wanted to discuss here, which is on domestic issues, but uh, good point. Oh, okay, I'll just, I'll just make one last point. Uh, Dr. Shinari, I, I know you said that the darkest point was when, when the Taliban took over. I would suggest when the warlords were running things, things were much worse. Rape, murder. So the Taliban, I, I would say they would, they would buy into primary care, believe it or not. So anyway, I'll, I'll leave you at that, but that's... <laughs> Uh, okay, let's uh, go to Anne. Right, right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was disappointed at the amount of space given to nutrition in this summary of the DHS. I worked on a survey on gender and nutrition a couple of years ago in Afghanistan. At, at that time, the, stat the statistics were 10% of children were wasted, which means severely malnourished, 30% were chronically malnourished, and 25% were underweight. So that's two-thirds of children were malnourished at the time. And that, of course, means they're more vulnerable to disease. They don't intellectually and emotionally develop as well as physically. So they're not able to learn as well. They, um, the, this cyclicity of the fundamental importance of nutrition continues in the ge next generation. So a woman who's born very young also tends to have <coughs> low birth weight children and there are epigenetic consequences that go on for generations as well. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the nutrition status, I mean, actually the numbers of children who are stunted is over the World Health Organization emergency level. Um, and. Uh, so that the consequences in terms of individuals' ability to combat disease and learn and grow and contribute to an economy are very seriously affected by this. Um, just at one point that uh, was very interesting in our study is that a lot of NGOs are giving very good counseling within communities, but the, the women do not do the shopping. The men do the shopping, and they're choosing the foods. So training needs to be given to the men as well. And so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, it, my question is, how much emphasis is there in, in the ministry on nutrition, um, and how, how, what types of efforts are you thinking of focusing on in the future? Thank mm, you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, with regards to nutrition, you know, as the uh, DHS says that slightly more than 40% of children under age of six months are exclusively breastfeed. Uh, it is optimistic, but it's not up to idle. You know, we need, because it's less than uh, 50%. As well as, you know, uh, Though 56% of children aged 6 to 8 months are receive complementary feeding, only 10% of these children are fed the minimum acceptable diet. This is the results that shows. You know what the ministry is doing or what has been done so far uh, with regards to attention to nutrition, we are working to, ch to change the ministry name, Ministry of Public Health and Nutrition, because nutrition is very important. This is one. We are also working to upgrade the status of the unit and bring it, you know, remove the layers that they are reporting and give them more power at autonomy. As well as, you know, nutrition is one of the priority, as well as chronic malnutrition and acute malnutrition. We are focusing about acute malnutrition because chronic malnutrition is, you know, when the uh, the time, you know, point, important point is that we need to focus on pregnant mothers and we need to show, you know, the nutritious status of infant while she's pregnant. You know, this is very important as well as up to the six months after delivery. These are the golden periods the ministry is working for that. And afterwards, you know, really standing is an issue. This is really a problem. Uh, in terms of, you know, future, in terms of vulnerability of kids. But my main point is that we are focusing on mothers, pregnant mothers. We can't, you know, we want to prevent stunting 
you know, when the mother is pregnant, this is the time that we can deal with it effectively. If I could add, I mean, your point's well taken, and it was in my notes, and my staff will kick me later for skipping over that part. But it, it is something we're seized with, not just in Afghanistan, from India all the way up through Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Central Asia. And one of the challenges I have is defending our budgets before Congress. And one of the points that I repeatedly make, talking again about the interactedness of all these issues, um, in Pakistan, for example, 45% of five-year-olds are intellectually stunted due to malnutrition. In Sindh province, the number is upwards of 60%. And that isn't a national security problem for us now. But in 10 years, those five-year-olds will still be intellectually stunted unless we intervene. They will still be intellectually stunted. They will not be educated. They will not be employable. And they'll be angry. And 15-year-old military-age males may very well be a national security problem in Afghanistan or in Pakistan or across the region. So USAID is working among all of our missions to find ways, for example, to fortify grains. There are, there are some fairly simple fixes that working with the various ministries, and, and this isn't easy because our bureaucracy is bad enough. The bureaucracies of Central Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India are uh, infinitely more complicated. But, but working with all the different ministries that have a piece of this to find ways to provide fortified grain at affordable prices to women, uh, to families, so that they can, in fact, address malnutrition. Okay, right to the front. Oh, I just wanted to add. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I agree with you that the warlords, um, you know, were worse than Taliban in terms of what they did. But as a physician, you know, in the beginning I said I'm going to look at it from the medical and health perspectives. In the Taliban regime was the time, you know, when I started, the, started my journey in medicine and health. That's why, you know, I just took a look into their regime and their um, kind of effects, you know, or their, their activities impact on the health and medicine. In the meantime, you know, they were considered as a, as a regime that had 90% control over the country, right? If you compare them with the warlords, warlords at the war time of the warlords, when they were fighting the country, they were scattered around the country. Uh, and there were like different governments small governments and ev every province had its own government you know in, in power so uh, that would be something you know if, if, uh, if you want if you want to talk about it it's going to take days because that's something more political and i just wanted to cover you know the things from the health and medical perspectives uh, uh, from the taliban time mr minister ishrat hussein from woodrow wilson center i'm very impressed by the improvement in the indicators of health and demography. What I wanted you to focus, uh, based on the empirical evidence from other developing countries, is that the public health ministries themselves do a great job, but the correlates of health outcomes depend on a number of other factors. For example, water supply, sanitation, pollution caused by wood, and charcoal burning by uh, nutrition and food supply. And one of the difficulties has been lack of coordination between the different ministries. Each one of them wants to do their own things. And between the central ministries and the provincial governments or the district governments. Because most of the delivery takes place at the local level. So while you are uh, formulating your strategy, you might think of the instruments through which there could be better coordination between different parts of the government and between the federal and the provincial and the local governments. And that is something which you, as a latecomer, having good intentions, can benefit from the international experience of the health. Because I've found in my experience at the World Bank working for 20 years that the Ministry of Public Health do not enjoy the kind of status which other ministries do, and therefore they are always very, very, uh, I must say, less influential in influencing the public policy. But the, your record is so impressive that I would very much like you to think about the coordination uh, to improve the outcomes even better than what you have done. Very good point. Thank you for that. You know, let me uh, elaborate a bit about that. You know, as health is not only, you know, the absence of disease. Uh, 
health is related strongly related to other sectors other than health sector uh, for example education sector unemployment development sectors this is why we you know working with other ministries for example working with the ministry of education we are distributing my, uh, no, micronutrients for example folic acids uh, folic acids among you know adolescents girl in the schools to prevent anemia and you know you know anemia is one of the major causes of maternal deaths in afghanistan as well as you know health topics and hygienic practices are part of the curricula in schools as well as you know hygienic practices are being promoted through media and as a result of that we have to to you know make sure to prevent disease and promote health we have established intersectoral coordination committee the minister of health is not chairing because other ministers all you know have the same level the same power this is why we took it the palace the president is now the chairman of that committee and you know to make sure that we are promoting health and preventing and i take your comment thank you for that this very uh, uh, constructive mm. yeah go ahead i have a question that's related uh to the civil society and health organizations and associations the question i was wondering is what is the ministry doing and the government doing to ensure that the enabling environment in civil society is actually one that allows um, organizations like the afghan midwives and asmo the afghan social marketing organization to actually grow develop and thrive they're focused very much on the health aspects which they should be but the Ministry of Economy's role, the Ministry of Justice role, and the Law of Association, and the Law of Organizations, it creates a very complex environment for any organization, any domestic NGO or international NGO for that matter, to function in Afghanistan, and to grow, thrive, raise money, etc. You know, exactly, I couldn't catch you. Uh, Sorry, I speak very fast. The question, the question is, is how do you create how do you create an enabling environment for okay. civil society to function effectively? Because it is so, as Larry Sampler indicated, it's so complex and bureaucratic as an NGO to function within, an, uh, within Afghanistan that it can be very difficult for an organization to grow, develop, and build. And the examples I would use are the Afghan Midwives Association and the Afghan Social Marketing Organization. They're new organizations, they're growing, they serve a vital purpose, but they, have, they face a tremendous number of governance issues and burdensome reporting requirements in order to function, in order to try to even begin to get at their missions, they're struggling with governance issues. And there needs to be some coordination, in some people's opinions, between the Ministry of Economy, the Ministry of Health, and other organizations so that the environments are such that they can thrive, they can grow, they can be active, vibrant civil society organizations that reach the population they're trying to serve. Okay. You know, got it. Thank you for that. Very good point. You know, the Ministry of Public Health is committed to work with NGOs. NGOs also part of civil society. And you know, you know, uh, NGOs are providing uh, primary health care services throughout the country uh, through public-private partnership schemes or through, you know, contracting out mechanisms. NGOs, we see NGOs as a strength of the Ministry of Health. In non-secure areas, as they are, you know, uh, non-governmental, as they are independent, and, you know, they, are, they can provide better services in non-secure areas than the government because government employees are exposed to greater risk. So we use it. We use it as a strength. We have very, you know, strong collaboration with them. As I mentioned earlier, you know, the progress which has been made is as a result of productive working environment, not only with development partners, but also with non-governmental organizations. Uh, you know, also we established midwifery associations throughout the country, which is really, you know, now paying as dividend. We established, you know, OBGYN association <coughs> across the country, not only their voices are heard, but also to be part of the policy process, part of the implementation process. Well, with regards to other ministries, the government as a whole is trying to create an enable environment for everybody, for the private sector, for non-governmental organization. This is why we are fighting against corruption. This is why, you know, make sure or to, uh, greater efficiency and accountability. But the point is that, you know, we need to focus on mutual accountability as well. 
This is also very important. We are also responsible. At the same time, NGOs also should be accountable for the result. You know, this is why, you know, we, we uh, have taken the approach of contracting out performance-based partnership approach no, th within the framework of accountability that, you know, there is mutual accountability, NGOs accountable for certain, you know, results. And we are providing, you know, when they don't, you know, deliver what they have promised, then certainly they should be asked. Otherwise, you know, there is enabling environment and we are working towards of that. <coughs> yes. Thank you. I'm Dr. Nagbin. I just want to express how much we appreciate you as a Minister of Public Health in Afghanistan. We are so happy today to have you in here, Dr. Feroz, the Minister of Public Health. And also, personally, I'm happy to see you after 35 years. And I'm sure uh, we strongly believe that you have been providing the highest quality of care to the people of Afghanistan, not only quality of care, consistency, competency, and adequacy. And you have been working with your team all together to pursue achieving your mission. Your mission is Afghan satisfaction with integrity, accountability, hard work, teamwork, accuracy, honesty, and professionalism. We truly value the, all the efforts you have done so far for the people of Afghanistan. We appreciate it. And I wish you and I wish Afghan people a life full of happiness, good health, good luck, and prosperity. Just uh, have one question the end. The incidence of HIV AIDS in Afghanistan how many cases have been reported so far? Do you have enough sufficient fund for such a disease to be prevented, to promote health, to offer diagnosis and treatment? What strategic plan has been developed in order to address the increasing concern of HIV infection spread? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Nick Binsev. You know, thank you for your encouragement, you know, encouraging words. With regards to HIV AIDS in Afghanistan, fortunately, you know, the prevalence of HIV among uh, general population is very low. And we are trying to keep it as low as possible. The only pro problem is that, you know, now we are moving from a low epidemic to a concentrated epidemic. For example, uh, drug users or, you know, use of, you know, uh, uh, how do you say? You know, this one is HIV is very prevalent among drug users, among prisoners. We are focusing on the strategy is that to focus on vulnerable groups and the strategy is that to keep the numbers contained. But the problem is that there is, you know, inconsistency in numbers and data. For example, the number of uh, HIV people, or the number of people living with HIV AIDS is around 2000 with the ministry. But WHO and UNIT UN AIDS estimate is around 5000. So there is a discrepancy that we are working towards to improve the quality of data as well as to you know have a very efficient <coughs> and effective surveillance system and also working on uh, drug users. This is why we are you know uh, distributing clean syringes among drug users as well as among prisoners. We are providing information as well as we are you know, providing education to them to keep the number as low as possible. The point is that the prevalence or the national average of HIV among drug users is 4.4%. Unfortunately, in one state is more than 13%. This is really alarming, and this is why we are focusing and containing it among, you know, vulnerable groups. Let me pose a question that was posed from one of our, uh, one, someone who was uh, watching our, our live webcast, Sharon Epstein, who is the team leader for health at USAID 2012 to 2013. She says, uh, some years ago in the last mortality survey, um, 
uh, data was released, there was some skepticism about the data because in much of the country at the time, military actions were underway. Therefore, it was asked, how could the survey personnel reach people? How could the data and the conclusions be dependable for those areas and for the overall survey? So the question is now, given that military action has continued in parts of the country over 2014, 2015, how dependable are the DHS data and the conclusions that are drawn from that data? Well, it's uh, a good question, but the response is that, you know, we conducted uh, DHS Afghan Central Statistical Office with the Ministry of Health, with the guidance of inter ISIF internationals, with the support of USAID. You know, my point is that this is a very valid, you know, study in Afghanistan with very strong and robust sample size, with, you know, very thoroughly uh, process of data collections, with, you know, strong monitoring that people now, you know, the point is that because data has been collected by Afghans, and Afghans, Afghan knows, you know, where to go, how to go, how to collect the data. In addition to that, there was also backup support, monitoring of the process. And this is the first strong, valid, you know, demographic and health survey in Afghanistan. And we are proud of that. Certainly, there should be or can be some drawbacks, some problems, which is everywhere. In a, even in very stable situations, you know, this can be happened. But the point is that this is very valid. We cannot compare it with previous uh, surveys. Uh, previous surveys also can be used for general obser observations, but this survey will help us to, you know, not only help us. This survey showed that the money, that the AIDS money, the money that you are providing, you know, making a difference in Afghanistan, paying off in Afghanistan, you know, made gains in Afghanistan. This is one. The second point is we are going to use it as a baseline for our future. After five years, hopefully we'll be able to do it again to see the progress. Also with this data, we are able to compare among the provinces, which one is, you know, better off, which one is not. And really, this is the data that we can use it for policy formulations as well as for decision making. Yeah, Can I add please to that? go ahead. I, um, you know, the um, ICF, the, the international contractor who consulted and supported the ministry and CSO on doing this, have a specific goal of making sure that the quality of the data that's collected is useful globally for making point-on-point -point comparisons. Now, that's different from what was done in previous years where it was an Afghan-specific set of data that was collected. And I don't think that the DHS would have gotten the kind of credibility and traction that it's already been given if the technicians who were doing this with a global eye on quality data didn't feel that they had gotten good enough data across the country. And keep in mind, whether this is done in Afghanistan or somewhere in Africa or Central or South America, many of those countries have particular provinces or subnational regions that have problems. It may be a natural disaster or it may be conflict. So this is not unique to Afghanistan. But what the DHS gives us now is a study where the, the quality is a uh, sorry an international global gold standard of quality of data. It may not be perfect, but it has certainly been deemed good enough for use in this global database. We've got about 10 minutes left. And I want to try to ensure as many questions as possible can be, po can be posed. So I'm going to group them together. Uh, we'll start with the gentleman sitting on the aisle right there. Yes. We'll take a uh, few more. Thank you. My name is Juan Carlos Alegre with Management Sciences for Health. And uh, Dr. Frost, um, congratulations on, on your um, uh, significant achievements as evidence in, in the 2015 DHA survey. But my question relates directly to your vision about uh, making the health system in Afghanistan even stronger and resilient for the next five or ten years. So could you share with us um, your thoughts and vision about uh, making the health system in your country stronger uh, for the next ten years? Okay, let's uh, take a question from the gentleman a few rows up front. The yellow tie, I think that's yellow. Yellow tie, yes. Thanks. 
Um, uh, Mr. Minister, thanks for giving a very positive picture of the health sector. But I, as an Afghan, I have a question on, and you touched upon on the self-sufficiency of the health sector uh, over the long run. Mm, what is the future of the the future vision of the ministry on public-private partnership? Because if you look to the pharmaceutical sector, there is very weak re regulations, and there are many evidences and, and, and has been shown that uh, the regulation is so weak and multiple or hundreds of um, companies, uh, private sector companies are involved, which does not export, import quality medicines and that is a big issue and challenge in the country. So what the ministry is thinking about that and the second point that you mentioned in your opening remarks about uh, the capacity. Uh, yes, we understand that capacity has to be built and, and it takes years. But there is also strong opinions that how we can bring doctors, specialists, like in many other countries, that they can do in the private sector. And many Afghans are going outside of the country for simple treatment and spending thousands of dollars and, and, and even millions of dollars per day uh, abroad. They're going to Pakistan, India, Turkey, Central Asian countries in, in, in Europe. So how Minister of Public Health can sustain that environment or enable that environment so that private sector can invest and doctors can come from abroad and, and, and let they can charge. People are happy to pay and whom rather than going abroad. Thanks. Let's take one more question. Uh, the woman uh, toward the back. Um, yes. Can you put your hand up again so that Josh, yeah. The woman with her hand up right in front of you, Joshua, yeah. Hi there, Nicole Savage from the United Nations Foundation. Um, my question is about the conversation that was had earlier about polio eradication. Um, you know, there have been six cases in, in Afghanistan so far this year and 17 cases total in both Pakistan and Afgan Afghanistan. Some experts are saying that it's likely that polio eradication will be achieved or the, the stop, uh, polio transmission will be stopped by the end of this year. Um, I'm just wondering your thoughts if that's, if that's a realistic expectation um, and if you think that it's possible to actually um, stop the transmission of polio by the end of this year. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, with regards to, you know, making the system stronger and resilient, you know, the vision is that for the five next year that we want to, you know, the priority is that to increase access to underserved and remote areas. Because still, you know, 40% of population does not have access to primary health care services. This is one of the priority areas that we need to focus. Uh, second priority areas that we need to, you know, uh, less than 60% of our health facilities uh, have at least one midwife. Means that the st still, you know, 40 to 45% of health facilities do not have midwives or at least a trained scalp midwife. This is also another priority area that we are going to work on that. Third one is, you know, we are focusing or strengthening the institutional capacity of the ministry rather than individual. This also will help us work focusing on system building, fighting against corruptions, working with, you know, development partners together, having, you know, a very obvious and clear uh, framework of accountability, I'm sure, you know, we'll be able to make the system stronger, efficient, and uh, to be able to effectively meet the needs of the population. With regards to PPP, yes, you know, this is the policy of government of Afghanistan that we are going to attract and encourage, encourage the private investors to come and to participate in this process. We have finalized regulations for public-private partnerships. Uh, before coming, before my trip, you know, I invited all the investors in Afghanistan and we discussed with them. We explained the advantages and disadvantages of having partnership with the Ministry of Health. We, you know, really reflected the strong support that we have for them and the uh, enabling environment that you are going to provide for them. You know, the aim is that, as you mentioned, still, you know, Afghans spending too much money outside the country for seeking medical care. 
And we cannot, you know, shift resources from the provision of primary health care services to improve the quality of tertiary care. PPP is the only means that we can, uh, you know, attract private investors to work with us and to be able to prevent people going outside the country. This is with regards to, you know, imported medicines or counterfeit medicines. Uh, fortunately, we have established National Medicines and Health Products Regulatory Authority. This is the first initiative you know, that we have taken in Afghanistan. This is the first time, like FDA in the United States or other countries, to enforce the law as well as to make sure the quality, affordability of essential medicine in Afghanistan. With regards to capacity, uh, Capacity, you know, we say that learning is by doing. In the past, the approach was that uh, mostly international consultants or national consultants uh, came to the ministry and started working by themselves instead of letting the actual job holders to do that. So the learning did not take place. And now the approach is that we are using consultants or advisor as a mentor, as a coach. And the actual job is doing by the actual job holders. And through this way, we'll be able to, you know, uh, and the technical assistance or uh, capacity building will have a long lasting impact in the ministry. Was there anything? Oh, polio. Well, you know, <laughs> thank you for that. You know, as I mentioned, that the government of Afghanistan remains passionately committed to eradicate polio in Afghanistan. But our efforts is, you know, directly dependent on uh, our neighbor's effort because the population movements. This is the problem. And insecurity is another challenge in Afghanistan that we, you know, hampers our progress. This is why we have tried to improve coordination, cross-border uh, cross coordinations with our neighbors. We have, you know, synchronized campaigns. We have uh, regular meetings with them. We are sending teams to Pakistan as well as their experts coming to Afghanistan for the uh, opinion, experts' opinion exchange as well as we engaged uh, religious leaders because of the, that false belief that uh, polio is not non-Islamic. We take, you know, polio, even we established polio coordination steering committee under the chairmanship of the president of Afghanistan to hold, you know, to increase accountability. So I'm sure first, you know, the one thing is sure that we can contain the numbers. We do not let to increase from six above. And hopefully to be able to stop it by the end of this year, the circulation of polio virus will be stopped. And the eradication is maybe after three, four years. Although we were committed to do it by end of June, but unfortunately, you know, there are some factors beyond our control. This is the problem. Well, um, we need to wrap up in a moment, but I just want to take two more questions. Several folks have had their hands up for a while. So we'll, we'll end with the, first of all, the gentleman right in the aisle there. He'll go first, and then we'll take a question up front. Yeah, yeah I have a question that to what extent are practical concepts and, and awareness and, and information infused into the f curriculum, educational curriculum, formal curriculum, from primary to secondary? In other words, uh, melded naturally with subjects such as science, math, language, religion, etc. Uh, it seems that, that that could also make the educational curriculum more relevant to people's needs, to the children, parents, teachers, community. It's, it's worked well, I know, with considerable aid support in Zambia, probably other countries. And, 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 and especially related to your mentioning the inner sector coordination committee. Thanks, and we're gonna end two more questions The two women sitting right next to each other. Uh, fourth row from the back, yes. 
Um, thank you very much. And I'm very uh, impressed by um, the uh, minister's, uh, um, the government's achievement so far. And I'm also impressed by uh, the empath's uh, support. Um, so my question is now is to uh, Dr. Shinwari. Um, what I learned from you is you also uh, had some programs that oversee from here or from other places to support uh, Afghanistan in, in the local, um, you know, uh, you have uh, the programs from here. But I, so I think I would like to echo the other questions from another gentleman about the pharmaceutical sector. So I wish to know whether you uh, have any coordination with uh, other professionals, like for, for example, pharmaceuticals and nurses. And my focus is on pharmaceuticals. And uh, so would you be able to provide uh, some, like coordinate with them and also have some programs that you could help the uh, government uh, in Afghanistan? Uh, 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 for example, that you could be part of the uh, public, uh, private uh, uh, partnership or provide some capacity building to the local uh, pharmaceutical sectors uh, and staff or professionals, especially on the regulatory and quality control, quality assurance to uh, 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 combat the uh, uh, counterfeit medicines. Thank you. Thanks. Final question. Yes. Hi, hello. Um, thank you so much for being here. And also thank you for your emphasis on uh, maternal and reproductive health for a panel that doesn't have women on it. You guys are doing a really good job of emphasizing that, um, especially with the midwives, so gold stars. Um, I also I wanted to ask a question about the survey itself um, in terms of data collection and data verification. You touched on it a bit earlier, but looking at any lessons learned in the process itself, and if you're looking to expand the survey or the method of the survey to other um, social or sectoral issues and coordinating with other ministries, hypothetically with education and any lessons learned there. So, thank you. Thanks. Did you want to start, Dr. Faraz? Okay. Or Stu? Go ahead. Come on, let's begin. All right. Thank you. Finally, I have a question. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, we do. Um, I mean, we do get involved, uh, in, you know, in variety of uh, activities. Um, uh, luckily, we, when we say Afghan, uh, I mean, first it was Afghan Physicians Association. And later on, uh, we realized that, oh, we do have some other players, you know, that can contribute a lot uh, to the health sector or to the health of our Afghan community. So we changed its name to Afghan Medical Professionals, So which means that we added other professionals in medical field, for, uh, pharmacists, you know, uh, nurses, dentists, and all others. So we have, in terms of our human resources, we do have some people, and they are ready to help the health sector. And that's why we, we signed the agreement of uh, collaboration with the Ministry of Public Health uh, to, to uh, give us this opportunity to you know, conduct whatever projects and programs that we have. In terms of pharmaceuticals, what we can do from here is just to educate people, and that's what we do. For example, you know, take, you know, how to take the medications and how important they are, how important their timing and schedule is, the follow-up and all these things. That's what we do through media. Uh, to our people and also the consultation that we provide through Skype, you know, to our patients. But it, 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 it is not something easy. It's just if we compare it with the security, with having 350,000 uh, security forces in Afghanistan, <coughs> along with the support from international community, we're still, we, we weren't able, you know, to bring security in the country. Why? Because, you know, as insurgency is pouring from neighboring countries to Afghanistan, the medications, the counterfeits and substandard medications are also pouring into the country. And it's hard sometimes, you know, to stop this illegal trade. And, and I'm glad, you know, we came up with some, uh, you know, Minister of Public Health um, I mentioned the initiative, you know, that regulatory uh, board or, you know, the initiative, it will solve a lot of, you know, most of this problem. But still, this is very hard because of the, p uh, the border that we have. The same, you know, the polio is exported from outside. The counterfeit substandards are coming from outside to the country, and it's really hard to stop them. If you stop them, yes, you will be able to stop them in, in the places where the government has control. But where the government does not have control, so the people will keep using those medications, the substandards, counterfeits, and the reason will be they are cheap. So that's why they will have access. To and that, that's, that has made it hard for us, too. All we can do is, since the people in remote parts of the country uh, use radio a lot, 
that's why we are providing education through Voice of America radio program to those people and get online, I mean, live, and they ask, uh, they ask us questions, and then we provide enough information about, you know, uh, or educating them about the pharmaceuticals. And of course, yes, we do uh, collaborate with other organizations, uh, you know, who are interested, Afghan and non-Afghans. Our telemedicine program, we are uh, partnering with two other organizations, uh, and, and anyone who is interested, interested to work with us with AMPA, so welcome, they're welcome to come and join us in, in this journey. Let me comment about, you know, insecurity. Uh, no, you know, no doubt that there is one thing that it would have, you know, the greatest, greatest impact on the health of population is peace. <coughs> and, you know, insecurity is really a complex issue. As the unity government of Afghanistan is trying its best to change the situation for the better and to be able to respond to the need of population. As well as, you know, U.S. troops and those others who are working in Afghanistan, they are trying to build the capacity of our army and police forces. And really, they are thriving and doing well. We are in the ministry uh, working as effectively we as can in, a, in, in an environment which is a mix of conflict and development. You know, the point is that we are working... Uh, on the need to maximize efficiency and flexibility to effectively effectively use resources devoted to the expansion of services. We are working with religious leaders. We are, you know, working with non-governmental organizations and civil societies. We are working with community elders. Through them, we will be able and we, we are sure that we will be able to make you know, to increase access to those areas uh, that are underserved and deprived from f uh, ser pri public services. Do you have the last I, word? Um, yeah, my last word. Thank you for your observation about the gender of the panel. Don't stop holding us accountable to things like that. It's really important. Um, but I, I want to make the point that um, sick mothers and sick children are also an economic problem for Afghanistan. We're not just pursuing maternal and child health because of the gender component. Hillary Clinton has famously said that no society can thrive economically when it only focuses or empowers half the population. And even further than that, if half the population is subject to sickness and to malnutrition, if children are not given the opportunity to grow and thrive, then the, the, you will not be able to build a sustainable economy. So uh, kudos for calling us out, and we will continue to focus on maternal and child health because it's important, and also it's important to the economy of Afghanistan. Well, thanks. Well, this has been a great discussion. I, I don't know if I would call it uplifting, but it certainly was instructive. It came close to uplifting. Uh, we just don't hear as much about Afghanistan in this town as we used to, which is, which is not good um, because there's a, a lot of troubling things happen, but also there's progress uh, happening on the ground, um, and some of it was highlighted uh, over the last hour and a half. So I wanted to, to invite you all to join me in giving a round of applause for um, His Excellency, Dr. Feroz. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also for Dr. Shinwari and uh, for Mr. Sampler as well. Thank you very much for coming, and we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.